when we uh, settled on the title for this talk a few a while ago, uh, not many people could have guessed how appropriate the title would be when the time came to meet here. Uh, nobody could have guessed how dramatically the world has changed in the last uh, few weeks and how far-reaching the implications are uh, for both uh, domestic orders and uh, the international order. Uh, the uh, democracy uprising in the Arab world has been a, quite a spectacular display of courage, uh, dedication, and commitment by popular forces. And it also teaches us a lot about ourselves. It's quite instructive uh, to, to observe the Western reaction to these uprisings. In part, it's very familiar. Uh, what's happening has happened many times in the past. Uh, it commonly becomes uh, difficult or impossible to salvage your favorite dictator. Uh, and when that happens, uh, there's a familiar plan that goes into effect uh, this time too. Uh, first, to try to sustain them as long as possible. No good? Yeah. It's okay. okay. Uh, try to uh, keep, sustain them as long as you can. Uh, when, if it becomes impossible, maybe the army turns against them or the business classes turn against them, uh, then what you do is uh, send them away somewhere and then try to restore as much of the previous order as possible. It happens over and over. Uh, Marcos in the Philippines, uh, Duvalier in Haiti, uh, and Mobutu in the Congo, Suharto in Indonesia, just case after case. Uh, it's nothing to be surprised about as to what's happening now. It's just replaying the familiar record. But there are differences. Uh, there are different efforts, different kinds of efforts to sustain the dictator. And uh, there are actually two factors that predict quite well uh, how hard the Western powers will work to sustain the dictator. Uh, one factor is how much oil they have. The other factor is how obedient they've been. In the case of countries that have a tremendous amount of oil and have been very obedient, then the effort to sustain the dictator is uh, very powerful. In fact, we've just seen it in the past few days. Uh, the, uh, the Saudi Arabia is the most obedient and has the most oil. Uh, so that's where the most effort goes. Uh, there, there was a planned uh, day of rage, an uprising in Saudi Arabia, but the security presence was so overwhelming that people didn't even try. They were too afraid even to appear. Uh, same happened in Kuwait, another uh, rich oil state with a very obedient uh, uh, leadership. And the, the same is happening in Bahrain. Uh, what about Libya? Uh, Libya has plenty of oil, uh, but it doesn't meet the condition of obedience. Uh, the uh, uh, Qaddafi has been um, pretty independent in many ways since uh, uh, since he took power. Well, he's a brutal dictator, all kind of atrocities for years, uh, but he has oil and he's a little independent. And that leads to conflicting policies. Uh, so the Western powers have strongly supported him. In fact, the extent of that support has just been illustrated in the last few days. Uh, uh, fortunately, the press has uh, suppressed it all, but uh, in the last couple of days, uh, the, there's a trial that has been going on in The Hague, a trial of Charles Taylor uh, from Liberia, who carried out, being tried for uh, massive atrocities in uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, and the prosecutors uh, uh, wanted to indict Gaddafi, because Gaddafi had been the main uh, funder and trainer of the forces that carried out the atrocities. According to the prosecutors, uh, he's responsible for over a million dead. But uh, Britain, the United States, uh, the Netherlands uh, intervened to prevent the uh, prosecutors from prosecuting Gaddafi. Uh, the way they put it is the international community 
meaning the U.S. and anyone who happens to agree with it, uh, that they intervened to, pr to protect uh, their friend Gaddafi from uh, the trial. The timing is not so good. It's not nice for that information to come out right when we're supposed to be hating Gaddafi, uh, so therefore it hasn't been reported. Uh, but you can find it out. It's just the last few days. Uh, and it's one of many examples where this uh, killer and torturer has been strongly supported by the West uh, because he has oil. But also, he's not too obedient, so he's often attacked, uh, sometimes directly attacked. For example, in 1986, uh, the U.S., as you know, I'm sure, bombed uh, uh, Tripoli and Benghazi and other uh, uh, Lib uh, Libyan cities. And that was a very remarkable bombing campaign. Uh, it also tells us a lot about the media. Uh, it was the first and only bombing in history that was planned for primetime television. And I mean it precisely. Uh, in the United States at that time, all television channels had their major news programs at 7 p.m. in the evening. And the bombing was carefully timed so that it would be at exactly 7 p.m. Now that was a pretty, pretty tricky operation because the planes had to fly from London to Libya and France didn't allow them to cross its territory so they had to go out into the Atlantic Ocean and uh, come by and uh, start the bombing exactly at 7 p.m. which is a difficult logistic uh, operation but they were able to carry it out. Uh, by accident, all the television stations happened to have bureaus in Libya at that time, and we're supposed to believe that that was by accident, too. In fact, uh, I had a friend who was a, a television correspondent for one of the major uh, uh, networks. He called me up at 6.30, half an hour before, and told me to watch television. He couldn't say what was going to happen, but uh, he said, watch the 7 o'clock news. And sure enough, at exactly 7 o'clock, the bombing took place, uh, exciting pictures on television, you know, uh, everything blowing up and so on. And after about 15 minutes of this, it shifted to Washington, where they were uh, standing there, and uh, the government uh, uh, was able to present its version of what happened. Well, that was an unusual bombing. It didn't have any credible pretext, but uh, Libya is an easy uh, kind of punching bag, you know, no, no support, uh, uh, so you can, get, you can do anything you like. And that's one of a number of cases. Uh, so it's been a kind of a mixed story with Gaddafi. And right now, that's the one country uh, where the West is uh, calling for supporting the rebellion, none of the others. Now, the others, you just we have to try to protect the dictator and the regime. But uh, uh, if you have to have some words uh, favoring the uprising, have the words, but try not to do anything about it. The uprising, in, uh, especially in Egypt, uh, happened to coincide uh, fortuitously with a very important uh, popular uprising in uh, the industrial heartland of the United States, in Madison, Wisconsin, Ohio, other states, where there's very significant uh, uh, popular uprising, uh, tens of thousands of people in the streets uh, occupying the state capitol, going on for weeks, uh, 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 working people defending the working people and uh, democracy. Uh, a very important event took place right in the middle of this on February 20th. February 20th uh, an Egyptian labor leader, uh, Kamal Abbas, uh, sent a message from Tahrir Square in Cairo uh, to uh, Wisconsin workers in which he said, uh, we stand with you as you stood with us. A statement of solidarity from Cairo workers to Wisconsin workers. Well, uh, there have been years of struggle of uh, uh, Egyptian workers for basic rights. This uprising is not coming out of nowhere. Uh, and uh, 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 Abbas's uh, message of solidarity evoked the traditional uh, 
aspiration of labor movements for back into the 19th century, uh, namely uh, solidarity among working people of the world, in fact, populations of the world generally. Well, labor movements have had many flaws, uh, but uh, they have regularly been in the forefront of popular struggles for basic rights and also for uh, democratic rights. In uh, Tahrir Square in uh, Egypt, uh, in the streets of Madison and many other places, the popular struggles that are now underway uh, reach quite directly to the long-term prospects for authentic democracy. I mean by that a democracy in which people have some role in determining uh, government policies. In uh, Tunisia and uh, Egypt, the, uh, where there's been a kind of a limited toleration of the uprisings by the West, uh, the, uh, there have been impressive victories. Uh, the, uh, but, but, but limited victories. The Carnegie Endowment, one of the main research institutes in the United States, a few days ago it uh, reported that while names have changed, the regimes remain. Uh, as they put it, a change in ruling elites and the change in system of governance is still a, a, a distant goal. Now the report goes on to discuss internal barriers uh, to uh, democracy. For example, the fact that, uh, crucially, the fact that in Egypt, the military, which still runs the country, uh, ha is deeply in involved, deeply uh, embedded in the system of uh, economic and political uh, uh, governance. Uh, they own large parts of the economy and uh, surely the high command, the uh, generals are not going to give up their uh, privileges and power easily. Uh, so they, re they do discuss internal barriers to democracy. However, they don't discuss the external barriers. And these are quite significant. Uh, for the United States and its uh, allies in the West, uh, we can be confident that they're going to do anything they can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. And there's a very simple reason for that, uh, which would be obvious if the basic facts were reported. But you can find them, they're public. Uh, I'm referring to studies of Arab public opinion. What they reveal is that in the Arab world, by overwhelming majorities, uh, Arabs regard the United States and Israel as the leading uh, threats that they face. Uh, in Egypt, the most important country, 90% uh, of Egyptians regard the United States as the major threat. The rest of the region, slightly lower, but uh, pretty similar. Uh, some of them, there are people who regard Iraq as a threat. Iran, sorry, Iran, the official enemy, is a threat at 10 percent. In the Arab world, 10 percent of the population considers Iran to be a threat. Uh, in fact, opposition to U.S. policy is so strong that a large majority uh, think the region would be more secure if Iran had nuclear weapons. In Egypt, that's 80 percent. Uh, other figures are pretty similar, but the conclusion is that if uh, there was something approaching real democracy in the Arab world, meaning the public, public opinion could influence policy, the United States not only wouldn't control the region, but it wouldn't uh, be there at all. It would be uh, eliminated, it would be expelled uh, along with uh, its allies, and that would undermine fundamental principles of uh, global dominance that go far back. Uh, support for democracy, uh, that's the province of uh, ideologists and propagandists, uh, but it's not part of the real world. Uh, in fact, uh, it's quite well established and even conceded reluctantly by the best scholarship that the United States supports democracy uh, only insofar as it uh, corresponds to uh, strategic and economic objectives. And in fact, the uh, contempt for democracy, not just by the leadership, but by the 
general intellectual community, a general elite contempt. That was revealed very dramatically uh, in the reaction to the, uh, the WikiLeaks exposures. Uh, the, the ones that received the most attention, you know, big headlines, uh, euphoric commentary, uh, were the cables that reported uh, that the Arabs uh, support the United States stand on Iraq on Iran, sorry, support the United States stand on Iran. Uh, the reference was to the Arab dictators. They allegedly support uh, U.S. policy, so that's wonderful. Uh, what about the attitudes of the public? If you check, you find that they were not mentioned. Public doesn't matter. And there's a principle behind this. It was uh, formulated quite uh, clearly by uh, well-known Middle East specialist, Marwan Washer, is formerly a high official of the Jordanian dictatorship. The principle is there is nothing wrong, everything is under control, meaning as long as the population is passive, apathetic, and obedient, you can disregard them. Uh, if the dictators support us, uh, th there's no other question that has to be asked. Well, this doctrine, the Washer Doctrine, is very rational and very venerable. I'll just mention one case that's highly relevant today uh, and should, again, be reported in the front pages if you want to understand what's happening. Uh, over 50 years ago, the President Eisenhower, in internal discussion since declassified, uh, he expressed concern over what he called the campaign of hatred against us uh, among the people in the Arab world, and not the governments, which are pretty supportive, but among the population. And he thought that might be a problem. The uh, highest planning body, the National Security Council, that came out with a major study about this, and it uh, explained that there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports uh, harsh and brutal dictators and blocks democracy and development and that we do it because we want to uh, maintain control over their energy resources. And it went on to say that the perception is pretty accurate and furthermore that's what we should be doing. Uh, 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 that's uh, correct. That uh, expresses the Muasher doctrine. Uh, it's rather interesting that uh, after 9-11, you may recall, uh, George Bush made a plaintive speech in which uh, he said they hate our freedoms. Uh, right after that, the Pentagon carried out a study to evaluate that claim and concluded that they don't hate our freedoms, they hate our policies. In other words, exactly uh, as in 1958. The United States and Europe are united in... Uh, uh, trying to punish Iran for its threat to stability. Uh, but it's useful to recall how isolated they are, the US and Europe. So the non-aligned countries, that's most of the world, 120 countries, uh, they've been uh, vigorously supporting Iran's uh, uh, uranium enrichment program for years. Uh, in the region, as I mentioned, uh, Arab public opinion not only supports that, but supports development of Iranian nuclear weapons. Uh, the major regional power, Turkey, voted against the latest uh, U.S.-initiated uh, Security Council sanctions, uh, along with Brazil, which is the most admired country in the South. Uh, their disobedience led to pretty strong censure. Uh, there's an authoritative answer to what the Iranian threat is. It's given by... Uh, the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence. Uh, every year they uh, provide an, an analysis to Congress of the global security situation. The last one, of course, uh, dealt with the Iranian threat, and they explain what it is. Uh, they say, first of all, that whatever the threat is, it's not a military threat. Give some quotes. Uh, Iran's military spending is relatively low compared even to the rest of the region, let alone the Western powers, uh, and Iran's military doctrine, they say, is strictly defensive. 
uh, designed to slow an invasion and force a, a diplomatic solution to hostilities. Iran, they say, has only a limited capability to project force beyond its borders. Uh, with regard to the nuclear option, they say that uh, if that Iran's willingness to keep open the possibility of developing nuclear weapons is a central part of the, their deterrent strategy. Now, that's the military threat. Uh, uh, the uh, brutal clerical regime is undoubtedly a threat to its own population, but it uh, hardly outranks uh, Western allies in that respect. Uh, there is a threat but it lies elsewhere, and it's ominous. Uh, one threat is Iran's potential deterrent capacity. That would be an illegitimate exercise of sovereignty, which might interfere with uh, the U.S. actions in the region. Uh, incidentally, it's glaringly obvious why Iran would seek a deterrent capacity. Just look at the disposition of forces in the region and uh, the constant threats to attack Iran by the global superpower in violation of the UN Charter, if anyone cares about that. In fact, when Iran tries to expand its influence in its neighbors, say Iraq and Afghanistan, well, that's called destabilizing. Iran is trying to destabilize the neighboring countries. But when the U.S. invades those countries, that's bringing stability. At the nuclear review conference about a year ago, uh, Egypt, which is chair of the 118 the non aligned countries, uh, called for negotiations on a nuclear weapons-free zone, which had, in fact, already been agreed by the West, but they hadn't done anything about it. Uh, international support for this was so overwhelming that President Obama was forced to agree formally. Uh, Washington informed the conference that it's a good idea, but not now. This isn't the time for it. Uh, furthermore, the U.S. made it clear that Israel has to be exempt from any such nuclear weapons-free zone. And, of course, the United States, but that goes without mention. Uh, what... Uh, Obama said is that, uh, Washington said is that uh, no proposal can call for Israel's nuclear program to be placed under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency or for release of information about Israeli nuclear facilities and activities. Okay, that takes care of that way of dealing with uh, the Iranian military threat. Uh, financial crises have been steadily increasing uh, ever since the regulatory apparatus was dismantled since, the, since Reagan, pretty much. And there are good reasons for it. It's understood why uh, a market system is going to regularly collapse unless there's regulation. Well, none of this is problematic for the very wealthy. Uh, they benefit from government policies. For the big banks and investment firms, which regularly create the crises, uh, they come out richer than ever, as is the case now. Uh, the reason is they have an insurance policy, a government insurance policy. It's called too big to fail. Uh, so if they crash the economy, uh, they can turn to the taxpayer to be bailed out. Uh, meanwhile, proclaiming their love of free markets. And that's exactly what's happened. It's been a regular process since the Reagan years. Uh, every crisis is worse than the last. Uh, and uh, uh, the crisis is more extreme than the last, at least for the public, and not for those who created the crisis. So right now in the United States, uh, unemployment is literally at depression levels for a large part of the population. But uh, quietly, a few weeks ago, uh, Goldman Sachs, one of the main architects of the crisis, which was bailed out by the public and is now richer than ever, uh, they announced uh, $17.5 billion in compensation bonuses for managers and their uh, director, the CEO, Lloyd Blankfein received a $12.5 million bonus, and his salary was tripled. That's right at the same time that for the population, uh, maybe 20% uh, 
qualify for food stamps. Well, it plainly wouldn't do it. It wouldn't do to pay attention to facts like these. Uh, accordingly, propaganda has to seek to uh, blame others, and so it does. You want to blame the vulnerable, of course. So one standard technique is blame immigrants. Now that's constant in a, a, reg, a regular in an economic crisis. Uh, that's been true throughout U.S. history, even more so at times of economic crisis. And right now it's uh, pretty common. Uh, who exactly are the immigrants who are doing all this to us? Incidentally, this uh, is exacerbated by a sense among the general population that their country is being taken away from them. And that's not entirely false. Uh, the white population is soon going to be a minority in the country. And people are aggrieved, not only by the economic crisis, but by the idea that their conception of what the country is, you know, with them topped off, that's disappearing. Well, who are the uh, immigrants? So where I happen to live, eastern Massachusetts, uh, many of the immigrants are Mayans. Uh, they're fleeing from uh, uh, genocidal operations in the Guatemalan highlands carried out under Reagan. The consequences are still there. So they're fleeing to the United States. Uh, others, immigrants, are Mexicans, victims of uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, that was rammed through by Bill Clinton over strong popular objection. But uh, the Clinton administration understood that it was going to lead to a wave of uh, flight from Mexico, uh, Mexican uh, uh, campesinos, you know, peasants, uh, can't uh, possibly compete with highly subsidized uh, U.S. agribusiness. Uh, Mexican businesses can't compete with uh, U.S. multinationals, which uh, have to be treated in Mexico uh, like Mexican businesses. Uh, it's called national treatment. That works for businesses, but not for people. Like a Mexican person doesn't get national treatment in the United States, but uh, General Motors gets national treatment in Mexico. Well, that's going to have obvious effects. Clinton understood it. And in fact, in 1994, same year as NAFTA, uh, Clinton initiated the militarization of the border. It had been a pretty open border before border established by conquest, like most borders. And pretty much the same people lived on both sides, moved up and back, visit their relatives and so on. Uh, but in 1994, the militarization of the border began because of what was clearly going to happen. And that led to a flood of uh, desperate refugees and also to rising anti-immigrant hysteria by the uh, People are the victims of the state corporate policies at home. Well, I don't have to tell you that uh, a lot, much the same seems to be happening in Europe. I've, I've always felt, and I think you can see it now, that the racism in Europe is probably more rampant than in the United States. So only you can just watch with kind of wonder as Italy complains now about the flow of refugees from Libya. Now, Libya happens to be eastern Libya, you know, the one part that's liberated, happens to be the scene of the worst, the first major post-World War genocide carried out by uh, the Libyan forces. And similarly, you have to wonder when France, which today is the main protector of the brutal dictatorships in its former colonies, uh, manages to overlook its hideous atrocities in Africa, well, Sarkozy warns uh, grimly of uh, what he calls the flood of immigrants, and Marine Le Pen objects that he's doing nothing to prevent it. I won't mention Belgium, uh, which probably wins the prize for what uh, Adam Smith called the savage injustice of the Europeans. You know all about that. Uh, the rise of uh, ultra-right nationalist parties in much of Europe uh, would be a frightening phenomenon, e even if we were not to recall what happened in the continent not very long ago. So just imagine, say, if uh, Jews were being expelled from France uh, to uh, misery and oppression. And after imagining that, 
witness what is happening, uh, and rather what is not happening, when uh, Roma, who are also victims of the Holocaust, uh, are expelled from France uh, to misery and oppression, Europe's most brutalized population. Uh, in Hungary, the uh, uh, actual neo-fascist party that gained 17% of the vote in national elections, the largest party, which is perhaps un not surprising when three quarters of Hungarians uh, think that they're worse off today than they were under communist rule. Uh, you might be relieved that in Austria, the far right uh, Jörg Haider party it won only 10% of the vote in the last election. You can be relieved about that until you notice that they were outflanked from the right by an even more rabid ultranationalist party, uh, which got 27% uh, of the vote. Uh, you might recall, it's kind of chilling to recall, that in 1928, uh, the Nazis won less than 3% of the vote. Things changed fast. Uh, in uh, England, the British National Party, English Defense League, on the uh, ultra-racist right are major forces. In Germany, uh, a book by Thilo Sarrazin uh, lamenting that immigrants are destroying Germany was a runaway bestseller. Uh, the Chancellor, Angela Merkel, she condemned the book but she added that multiculturalism had utterly failed. That is, the Turks who were brought in to do the dirty work in Germany are failing to become true Germans. As she put it, they're not adopting our Judeo-Christian heritage. The Judeo part was put in for obvious reasons. Uh, they're not adopting our Christian heritage. And therefore, multiculturalism has failed. Uh, well, I've barely skimmed the surface of these critical issues, but I don't want to end before making one last comment uh, uh, about uh, what's called an externality in economic theory, something you don't pay attention to when you're making transactions. Uh, in the financial system, uh, there is an externality that's well known. It's called systemic risk. That if you make a transaction, you don't pay attention to the fact that uh, it may crash the system. And when that happens, it's not a big problem because the taxpayer rescues you. There's another uh, externality, which is a little more serious, and that's destruction of the environment. Uh, it's uh, almost an imperative that, that in uh, semi-market societies that the environment must be destroyed. That's close to an institutional imperative. Uh, business leaders right now are conducting major propaganda exercises uh, to try to convince the population that uh, anthropogenic global warming, human uh, participation in global warming, is just a hoax. Now, those same business leaders understand very well that the danger is quite real and, uh, uh, and it, it might destroy what they own and their, their grandchildren's lives. Uh, but they can't, that's an externality. They can't pay attention to it in their institutional role as uh, their business leaders. They have to maximize the profit and market share if they don't they're out and somebody else is in which does it. It's an institution, it's a property of the institution and therefore it happens no matter what the consequences. And that uh, again creates a vicious cycle, uh, but this one might be truly lethal. In fact, to see how grave the threat is, just take a look at uh, the new Congress in the United States, mostly business funded, uh, 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 propelled into power by business funding and also propaganda. Almost all of them are climate deniers. Uh, they've already begun to cut funding for measures that might mitigate potential economic disaster, including funding for the International Agency, for the Environmental Protection Agency, and so on. Uh, worse still, some of them are true believers. Uh, for example, the head of one new committee on the environment, the new head, uh, he explained that global warming can't be a problem 
because God promised Noah that there wouldn't be another flood. Okay, that takes care of that. But the current economic crisis is also traceable in no small measure to an equally fanatic faith, a fanatic faith in certain dogmas, like, say, the efficient market hypothesis, uh, and more generally to uh, what Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz uh, back in the 90s uh, called the religion that markets know best. They'll take care of everything, so I don't pay attention to what's happening. Uh, that uh, sufficed to prevent the Federal Reserve, the central bank, and almost the entire economics profession from paying attention to the fact that a housing bubble was developing, $8 trillion housing bubble, not based on any economic fundamentals, and completely off the uh, to there had been a record of 100 years of the housing prices more or less uh, tracing economic growth. All of a sudden it shot up by $8 trillion and uh, not based at all on economic fundamentals. But you didn't have to pay any attention to it because of the religion. Well, devastated the economy when it burst. I don't think the BDS movement goes far enough. It should go much farther. And for example, it should, I think, adopt uh, Amnesty International's demand that uh, uh, Western countries impose an arms embargo on Israel, as was done in the case of South Africa in 1977. Uh, it hasn't done that yet. So, but uh, if the Human Rights Watch just called on uh, Europe to put an end to uh, all uh, uh, to purchase of goods from the settlements or any other actions that might support the occupation. Well, it's a pretty conservative organization. Yeah, I think is Europe ought to do that. Uh, United States as well. So a lot that can be done. But when you carry out um, actions like any any action, any protest action, you have to, if you're serious about it, you have to ask some questions. The one question you have to ask is, what's the effect on the victims? Uh, you have to make a distinction between tactics that make you feel good and tactics that actually help the victims. So to take another case, in the case of the Vietnam War, uh, there were sections of the American young activist movements, uh, the weathermen, uh, who decided that the way to oppose the war was to uh, march down the street and smash windows and uh, so on. The Vietnamese didn't like that, and they didn't like it for a very good reason. It helped create support for the war. Uh, what they called for very properly and openly was uh, nonviolent actions, like, for example, their proposal, uh, women uh, demonstrating silently in front of a cemetery. They thought that was great, but not smashing up uh, windows on Main Street. And the reason is they cared about the consequences. They didn't care whether American protesters felt good. They didn't care at all about that. They want to know what's going to happen to them. And exactly the same questions arise constantly. So quite apart from questions of principle, what happens if you call for a boycott of, say, Tel Aviv University? It's a gift to the hard right. They're going to come back right away, as in fact they do, and say this is total hypocrisy, as it is. They want you to call for a boycott of Harvard or Oxford, let's say, which have much worse records than Tel Aviv University. And you don't have any answer to that. Uh, so you're giving them a gift. Uh, you're allowing them to discredit the whole movement by charges of hypocrisy. Uh, and uh, if you have the interests of Palestinians at heart, you don't do that. Uh, there are you know, what are called negotiations going on uh, with uh, the United States mediating uh, a conflict between the two sides. And Europe accepts this. Europe discusses this as if these are negotiations. Now, Europe is timidly following along beyond, behind the master. It doesn't have to, but it is. Uh, if there were serious negotiations, they would be conducted by some neutral party. Uh, for 35 years, the U.S. has been blocking a political settlement. Europe disagrees in words, but nevertheless goes along with the master. Uh, and the political settlement is supported by the entire rest of the world. And everyone knows 
pretty much what it is. I don't have to run through it. Well, as long as that continues, uh, it's going to be like South Africa right through the 1980s. And there can be a change, but the change is going to have to come in the United States and in Europe. And as long as, say, uh, in Belgium, it's impossible to discuss this topic, the change is not going to come in Europe. Uh, changes have to be here. It's here that uh, it's going to be necessary to carry out the educational, organizational, other activities, uh, which will lead to breaking the opposition to a political settlement, uh, the opposition to any uh, uh, rights for the Palestinians. That's preventing anything from happening here and, of course, in the United States. But if you take a look at WikiLeaks, uh, it, most of it is what you'd expect to find in diplomatic cables, but that's true if you look at declassified uh, documents uh, generally. Uh, however, there are real revelations. Uh, so, for example, uh, take, say, Honduras. There are leaks from the American Embassy in Honduras, which didn't get reported uh, for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, you'll recall that in 2009, there was a military coup in Honduras, uh, which overthrew the elected government, and the Obama administration, after some vacillation, ended up supporting it, opposing almost all of Latin America and even most of Europe. Well, one of the WikiLeaks cables is a, comes from the U.S. Embassy in Honduras, right at the beginning, which says they've investigated the uh, uh, expulsion of the president, and they give a long analysis, and they conclude that it's illegal and unconstitutional. I then went to Washington, where uh, the U.S. administration disregarded it, they refused to call it a military coup, and went ahead and supported it. But maybe the most sensational leak, which really ought to get headlines, is from Pakistan. Uh, there are cables coming from the American ambassador in Pakistan, Ambassador pa uh, Patterson, who incidentally supports U.S. policy in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But what she's pointing out repeatedly is that U.S. policies in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, first of all, are making the population so anti-American that, you know, it's approaching 100 uh, percent anti-American extremism. Uh, and they're also threatening the uh, to radicalize and destabilize Pakistan. What she's pointing out is that, and the leaks are pointing out, is that U.S. policies in Afghanistan and Pakistan are threatening uh, to bring about a situation in which fissile materials will leak into the hands of radical Islamists. Now, this goes back a ways. There are two ten crucial tendencies that have been developing in Pakistan since the Reagan years. One is the development of nuclear weapons, a huge nuclear weapons capacity. That's one of Ronald Reagan's gifts to the world with his allies. The Reagan administration and their allies pretended they didn't know that Pakistan was developing nuclear weapons. Of course they knew, but they pretended that they didn't so they could continue to support the dictatorship. The dictatorship was the worst dictatorship in Pakistan's awful history, Ziel Haq, who was not only developing nuclear weapons, but was carrying out radical Islamization of the country with Saudi funding. Uh, and the, the West was supporting that. Uh, that means these madrasas in which uh, people only study the Quran and jihad and so on. And it spread. Now you go back a couple of weeks, uh, remember there was an assassination of a Pakistani a political figure who uh, condemned the blasphemy laws. And right afterwards, there were huge demonstrations supporting the assassins. And those demonstrations included, crucially, the progressive reformist elements in Pakistan, uh, the, law the young lawyers uh, who were instrumental in uh, overthrowing the Musharraf uh, uh, dictatorship. They were protesting in support of the assassin. They're the products of the madrasas. Now, this is, it, it's not a majority of the population, but there's a strong stream of radical Islamism supported by the West, nurtured by the West, now substantial, including plenty of uh, people involved in the nuclear weapons program and leading uh, Pakistani uh, nuclear physicists. Well, you know, that's the ultimate threat, uh, a nuclear weapon going off in London or New York.
And the U.S. and British and other policies are supporting that. That comes out of WikiLeaks. So there's important things coming out. Uh, the idea that this is orchestrated by the CIA is so outlandish that you can't even talk about it. Um, there are good questions about whether a no-fly zone should be uh, imposed. But should it be imposed by uh, the government that 90% uh, of Egyptians think is the major threat to their interest and similar figures throughout the Arab world? Uh, when you move over to Northwest Africa, Tunisia, uh, Mor Morocco, it's France that's regarded as the major enemy. Actually, this series of uprisings uh, did not begin in Tunisia. It began in Western Sahara. In uh, November, uh, there was a nonviolent protest in the Western Sahara, a big tent city put up. Uh, the Moroccan troops came in and smashed it all up. Incidentally, exactly what Saudi forces did today in Bahrain. It was a tent city which they moved in and smashed, if you like symmetry. Uh, there was enough protest about that, so there was an effort to bring it to the Security Council. It was blocked by France. France is going to carry out, uh, impose a no-fly zone. And uh, I don't have to go through the record, but there's a pretty heavy burden uh, to meet before Western powers lift their finger. Suppose we agree that there should be a no-fly zone. Well, does the West have to impose it? Uh, how about the Arab League? The Arab League claims that they want a no-fly zone. Uh, they have easily have the military capacity to impose it. I mean, the dictators in the Arab world, Arab League, I mean, they're collapsing under the weight of uh, high-tech uh, foreign uh, uh, aircraft, tanks, everything else that the West has been lavishing on them uh, to recycle petrodollars. And so they got all of this. Or take, say, Turkey, which is the most respected country in the region by far. You look at the polls. Uh, it's a NATO power, major military force. I mean, are they talking about military intervention? They can certainly carry it out. Uh, I should say that the Arab press has been condemning the Arab dictatorships for not doing anything. So maybe there ought to be intervention. But should it come from the most hated countries in the region with a long history of uh, destruction, violence, and repression? Or should it be uh, internal? Well, those are considerations that should be raised. Uh, maybe one decides after raising all of these considerations that nevertheless the West should intervene uh, to support the rebellion. Uh, remember that the intervention is not motivated by humanitarian concerns, but because they could be ended by just ending the rebellion, which nobody's calling for. Uh, uh, the issue is, as the question put it, should we support the rebellion? Well, okay, suppose you decide you should, despite all of these considerations. Uh, okay, then maybe it would make sense. But uh, unless all of these considerations are brought into uh, account and one thinks them through, the questions just don't even arise. Uh, in fact, uh, take, say, Sarkozy, who's been in the front of calling for some military action. Uh, why is he wasting his time at the Security Council? where nothing's going to happen. We know that in advance. Now, why isn't he pressuring uh, the Arab states to do something this minute? You know, why isn't he pressuring Turkey to carry out a no-fly zone? The Security Council won't block it. Well, I presume he's not doing that because he doesn't want any action. Uh, he wants to talk. You know. The best move for Greece might be just to default. Uh, say, OK, we're not going to pay the debt. Uh, what would happen then? Actually, that's been done before. There's a model that happened with Argentina. Uh, Argentina in the year 2000, it had been the poster child for the IMF, uh, best doing just marvelously. Uh, and it crashed, it collapsed. Uh, the standard uh, procedures were uh, applied. IMF, uh, you know, World Bank, uh, imposed structural adjustment, meaning transfer the the costs to the poor and the working people, uh, and uh, then, you know, taxpayer pays it off. They refused. They defaulted. They didn't pay the debt. But they were too big to fail also. Uh, foreign investors couldn't do anything about it. 
They defaulted. They broke all the rules. Uh, they rejected IMF um, 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 advice. You know, advice means order. And they had a huge period of economic growth, the biggest economic growth in uh, the hemisphere through the last 10 years. Well, I don't say that would happen with Greece, but it's a path that could be considered. In fact, Europe altogether is following economic policies which are really self-destructive. In fact, there's a name for them in at least US economic theory. It's called Hooverism. Uh, Europe is following the policies that Herbert Hoover followed in 1929, namely, in the midst of a depression, impose austerity, which of course is, uh, we know what had happened, it made a huge depression worse. Um, the problem of the economy is insufficient demand. Now, the corporations have money coming out of their ears. The banks are richer than ever. They don't invest, they don't want to lend. Uh, there's very limited demand. It's not coming from consumers. It's not coming from corporations. There's only one source. It's got to come from the government. There has to be a stimulation of the economy which will create demand and uh, use unused capacity which is going to waste and grow the economies out of uh, a deficit. I mean, each country has its own problems. They're all different. But there's a general uh, a general line of advice. Uh, there has been a big change in the last, uh, in recent years, in global power. It's not really a change among states. It's a class change. In recent years, uh, working people all over the world uh, have seen their share of national income decline. That's true almost everywhere. It's true in the West, it's true in China. Uh, China has some of the worst inequality in the world, uh, and it's been growing. Um, there's plenty of labor protest in China, you know, tens of thousands of labor actions every year in protest. And there now you have them in Wisconsin, you have them in Egypt, and so on. Now that's part of a major change of the you know, post 1970s economy, reducing the share of national income and all other rights. Uh, in the hands of working people, peasants, workers, and so on, and increasing concentration of wealth in a very small part of the population. That's a major change, and it's pretty much independent of 